Demokratie. Europa ist eben viel mehr. Zusammenarbeit zwischen den Völkern. Frieden. Bürger der Europäischen Union. The Latvian capital, Riga, with its proud Hanseatic legacy. When Latvia joined the EU in 2004, hopes and expectations were high. The past seven years have generated optimism and disappointment in equal amounts. Downtown Riga is Latvia's economic and cultural center. We are eager to find out how EU membership has affected the country's 2.2 million residents. The stunning historic buildings of Riga's old town house a number of Scandinavian banks that continually primed the pumps with easy money. That led to explosive growth as Latvia took on EU membership. Conspicuous consumption was a watchword in Riga as newly prosperous business people bought up luxury cars and all the trappings of wealth. But things are much different these days. The crash came in 2008 as the global economic crisis hit Latvia especially hard. Bankruptcy was only averted through the billions of euros in emergency loans from the EU and the World Bank. The government embarked on a drastic austerity policy and unemployment skyrocketed. The nation's second largest bank was nationalized. And Latvia's dream of joining the Eurozone will remain just that for now. We sense the aura of change. We embark from the central bus station on a voyage through the country. Over 10 years ago, we made a similar trip to hear a variety of hopes and concerns on what EU membership would mean. Now, we'll be asking the same people to reflect on the pros and cons of belonging to Europe. Our first stop is Sasis. There we meet a businessman who offers us perspective on the economic situation. Then it's on to Dogopils, where we see how the ethnic Russian minority is faring. After that, we travel on to the Papa Nature Park to visit a young professional. Stop four takes us to Koldia to spend time with a typical Latvian family. And we wind up in Kochneza at Latvia's Garden of Fate. We are on our way to visit Latvia's biggest producer of construction bricks. It's headquartered just outside Sasis. We've scheduled a meeting with Janis Klavinch, the firm's technical advisor. When we first spoke to him in 2000, he was working in the same capacity at a cement plant. At that time, he saw Europe as a kind of mentor, a learning place for free market economies. This kiln is a throwback to Soviet times. Klavinch tells us that the brick is a traditional and very durable construction material. Sales are slowly picking up again in Latvia, a good omen. Klavinch tells us that subsidies fueled the economic boom that followed EU accession. Massive infrastructure projects further increased demand for construction materials. Growth in the sector averaged a staggering 50% in some years. Then came the financial meltdown, and two of Latvia's four major brick suppliers shut down. Employees accepted drastic pay cuts. Klavinch isn't complaining, but he grudgingly admits frustration that his research and development department was closed. 
We should concentrate on motivating our workers and seeking out new opportunities that Europe provides, he says. That's how we can hone our competitive edge. EU funds are making a difference in CESIS as well. Klavinch takes us on a tour, showing us how the very products his employer produces are being put to use. In this case, a castle is being refurbished. Klavinch then shares his personal report card of the pros and cons of EU membership. He says most Latvians are satisfied with the decision to join the EU and that early doubts have all but disappeared. Although he admits there are major problems, he still believes joining was the right decision. And yet, as we say our goodbyes, Klavinch laments the lack of opportunities for young people. High youth unemployment is a major problem in Latvia. Many people have deserted rural areas. Bucolic village scenes may look inviting, but there's not much to build a future on here. We head off southeast to Dugopils, home to Latvia's largest ethnic Russian community. Their presence is the result of massive Soviet relocation campaigns following World War II as Stalin made Latvia part of the USSR. We're told that most ethnic Russians living here today were actually born here. While the older generation still tends to speak only Russian, more and more of the young generation also speak Latvian. Dogopils appears to be much more colorful and lively than the first time we visited over a decade ago. This was how things looked in 2000. Gray, depressing and hopeless. We interviewed Margarita Hrolovica, who teaches Russian school children. She firmly believes they should be fluent in Latvian. Now we hope to find her again and also Katya, one of her star pupils from more than 10 years ago. Our search has borne fruit. Now 43, Margarita is still teaching Latvian. But in addition to the children, she now also instructs adults at a private school. Right now, she's testing her pupils' speaking skills. She tells us a good working knowledge of the language is more important than ever when it comes to finding a job. It's far more difficult teaching older students, but Margarita says the majority of ethnic Russians want to integrate. She adds that those who have already gone to the trouble of learning Latvian have easily integrated into society. After class, Margarita meets with Katya Knasheva. Ten years ago, Katya was a bright young student. Now she's married with a young child and working on her business degree. Katya tells us that she had no problems with prejudice, but that mastering the language was essential. Most young ethnic Russians have had the same experience. We ask her how she will raise her young daughter. She answers that the child will retain her Russian heritage, since the grandparents can't speak Latvian. That will force her to keep up with Russian. But Katya insists her daughter also master Latvian and an additional foreign language. <laughs> but the integration process isn't always so smooth. Some Latvians still see the Russian minority as a major problem. 
One of the biggest stumbling blocks is the language barrier, with some Russians still unwilling even to change their street signs. Margarita confides that her teaching salary has been cut drastically due to the economic crisis and resulting austerity budgets. To finance the renovation of her apartment, she spent a year abroad working at a fish processing plant in Scotland. Latvia's EU membership made it possible. Never give up hope, she says. She believes in a bright future, both in her professional and private life. A born optimist. She remarks that her own daughter has begun her university studies. To help finance the cost, Margarita will return to the Scottish fish factory. We're getting the feeling that the Latvian people are not prone to whining and complaining. It's time to leave Dogo Pills and head out into the countryside. On the way, we meet the Vilka Gustars family. Janis is unemployed. There's not much work in the construction sector these days. The family inherited a house in the country and decided to take advantage of it. It's less expensive, they reasoned. With a verdant vegetable garden, the family is practically self-sufficient. Everyone lends a hand, even the children. Yanis expresses the hope that the situation will improve, both for his family and the country as a whole. We must work harder and give it our all, he says. The couple are optimistic that things will change in the years ahead. Everyone is responsible for their own happiness, they believe. You have to accept things the way they are. So even here, no complaints, no excuses. Self-pity just doesn't seem to come naturally to Latvians. Olita is also unemployed since losing her job at a local supermarket. So the family raises ducks to put food on the table. The parents and their three children live on the ground floor of the farmhouse. There's no money to renovate the top floor. Still, they say that others are far worse off, with heavy debts to pay. Statistically, Latvia has the dubious distinction of having the widest gap between rich and poor. EU membership has brought myriad changes to this tiny country, and the further we travel, the more conspicuous these become. For instance, the three sugar factories that closed down shortly after accession they were considered economically unviable. Now, Latvia imports all of its sugar. We are headed for the Baltic Sea, Latvia's 500 kilometer long coastline. It's part of Latvia's identity, a place of reflection and learned respect for the forces of nature. We are deep in the Papa Nature Park in search of Latvian wild horses, the descendants of Europe's original wild breeds. When we first visited the park in 2000, the herd had just been relocated here. The plan was to allow these horses to run wild in a natural habitat. Back then, Legita Leibnitsa was studying environmental protection at the park. Today, we meet Legita in exactly the same place. We're surprised to see how much the herd has grown. 
The park started out with just 18 horses. Now it's got more than 60, the result of Papa Nature Park's novel experiment of reintroducing species into the wild and recreating a primordial ecosystem. Legita is convinced the project never would have gotten off the ground without generous EU funding. Other parks have since followed suit. Now it's in the whole country, it's around 20 places uh, like this. But this was the pilot one where it started, so it's um, the, 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 the more results you can see here in the landscape change, in uh, biodiversity, uh, more bird species, more uh, plant species. The park has also brought in 86 heck cattle, backbreeding the oxen that once inhabited European forests and meadowlands. The oxen and horses seem to get along with one another. Legita sits on the park's council of experts. Its primary goal is environmental protection. The next morning, we meet Legita at her home in Liapaya, some 100 kilometers away from her workplace in Koldia. It's a long commute. For Latvia, the EU membership brings more possibilities for investments. There are, of course, also disadvantages because many regulations and rules we have now we wouldn't have if there wouldn't be European Union, but I'm more positive about that. Legita is heavily involved in EU-sponsored environmental projects. She's angry that Latvia allows so much clear-cutting of timber. Wood is the country's leading export product. The long brick bridge signals the entrance to Koldia. The city seems to be a throwback to the 1930s. That's why it's often used as a backdrop for feature films. Legito works in the state and city planning department. EU infrastructure funding has made a difference throughout the country. But the revenue has to be channeled at the local level. Projects in this region include state-of-the-art water pipes and a new sewage system for Koldia. Under Soviet rule, most homes in the historic district had no running water. Those historic Hanseatic homes are also undergoing an extensive facelift. The old town has been designated a UNESCO cultural heritage site. Legita has a meeting with the director of the city planning office to go through a list of additional sites deemed worthy of protection. Legita tells us she loves her work, but there are drawbacks. The situation is quite, I would say, unstable nowadays in Latvia because uh, sometimes you don't know if you will have work after, after uh, months or after half a year, so uh, it's hard to plan. As Legita bids us farewell, she adds that she might have to seek work abroad, but she'd rather stay put in Kodia with its natural attraction, Europe's widest waterfall. We move on to the Courland region. Destination? The former Kuchen estate. A German has renovated the stately manor, transforming it into a fine hotel. German royalty used to own many of the fine estates that dotted the countryside here. 
a tiny ruling minority lorded over the region for centuries. It strikes us that past and present tend to collide in such bucolic places. We listen to the sounds of storks. Then it's time to move on. After some minor navigation problems, we find our way to the Bergmana family farm. As we arrive, Maria Bergmana and her husband are busy harvesting herbs to make organic tea. Maria has changed a lot in the past decade. We hardly recognized her. We met her for the first time in 2000. Maria had just received permission to open one of Latvia's first fully organic commercial farms. Before Latvia joined the EU, she farmed according to traditional methods and was worried about the hazards of imported food. Good traditions, uh, good healthy food, let's say, and to learn from good examples, not from bad. Now Maria is playing an active role in providing healthy food for everybody. As she watches over the herbal drying process, she tells us that she has become a member of several important EU groups advocating a healthy diet. And she's no longer worried about the EU's power to regulate what Europeans eat. You always have a choice. You can choose what food is better for you, what lifestyle is better for you. So I don't see such a big <laughs> problem uh, to be a member to Latvia, for Latvia to be a member of the EU. Maria often entertains groups at her farm and informs them about all the health benefits the different herbal combinations provide. She says the white melissa is a good drying agent and is also an important ingredient in herbal teas. But she advises caution with the hemp plant. Don't let the cows eat the seeds. Maria has concocted a variety of herbal teas as antidotes to aches, pains and illness. Over the past few years, she's concentrated on tea production, a booming market. Maria now exports her products to other EU nations. Maria says most Latvians are open to organic products. Her teas are selling extremely well. Maria's daughter Zame helps out where she can. But that will be coming to an end soon. She's moving to Germany. Her husband has found work there. And her brother has been working and living in Germany for some time now. The young woman is torn. She would love to remain in Latvia and help out her parents, but she doesn't want her son to grow up without a father. She talks to us in German. She's been studying the language for the past few years. Zame tells us that many Latvians are leaving and it's difficult, both for the people and their nation. But she says opportunities are few and far between here. She can't find a job and can no longer pay her loans or earn money for her family. So it's tough. A final farewell. Our goodbyes seem bittersweet. More than 200,000 Latvians have emigrated over the past few years. A major loss for such a tiny country. It's this very topic that dominates the last stop on our journey through Latvia. On Kokneza Island in the Dogava River, we attend a meeting of concerned citizens. What looks like a Sunday afternoon get-together is actually a national project. A participant tells us that thousands of trees are being planted for Latvia's Garden of Fate. 
It's a memorial to the 600,000 lost Latvians of the past century, those who have emigrated or who were deported or who were killed. Each tree represents an individual, perhaps an uncle, aunt, or classmate. All of the nameplates will be put into a museum that is still being built. The project is being financed through donations. The garden is scheduled for completion in 2018, in time for the centennial of Latvian independence. We're moved by the inner strength of the Latvian people, boldly facing the challenges posed by the past, the present, and the future. <laughs>